Leviathan's Wake gave us two viewpoint characters, Holden and Miller. Caliban's War doubled that to four, and that continued for the next three books. Babylon's Ashes, as the culmination of this period of future history, has no less than 19 viewpoint characters. Some are limited to only a single chapter, such as Nono in the prologue, trying to cope with life on the wounded earth. The three main viewpoint characters are shown by the first three actual chapters, Pa in chapter 1, Philip in chapter 2, and Holden in chapter 3. Pa and Philip both present the disillusionment with Marco's leadership, but from different perspectives. Pa sees his failure as the savior of the belt that they'd all been hoping for. He's willing to starve the village to save it. Philip shows the disillusionment with the man himself, the realization that his father is much, much less than what he pretends to be, and that he abuses those around him to maintain the facade to both the outside world and to himself. Four other viewpoint characters give us a view of what's going on beyond the ring gate, inside the area of the slow zone, where Medina Station now sits under free Navy control. The first, Salis, is one of the people involved in mounting railguns on the alien station in the center of the zone, to be able to fire at any ships coming through any gate. This was far more complicated than they had first thought. They couldn't drill into the surface, it was too strong, and they couldn't weld to the surface, since welding is melting, and they couldn't do that either. So they had to just wrap the entire station to have a surface that they could mount them on. But this isn't just about the logistical threat our heroes will face. A throwaway line could do that. We see from street level, if you will, how this looks to the Free Navy. While speaking with Vanderkost and Roberts in the drum of Medina, Roberts gets misty-eyed when she shares her view that Medina is the belter homeland that they always dreamed of. The thing they built today isn't to defend a choke point, is to ensure that the belter homeland can't be taken away from them like it always has been. This is a vital element to the story because previously Free Navy rank and file has been presented as the embodiment of belter rage for the most part. Cornered animals striking back or, or vengeful thugs. Following them like this helps to see the rank and file as people. We see Salas again in Jakulski's solitary chapter who is on hand when the renegade Martian faction sends personnel to help with the security system. Protecting the slow zone protects the way to the new Martian settlement sea. They arrive on the Proteus, a ship that came out of the renegade's gate that had never gone into it. Something new and secret. When we later return, Vanderkost is our viewpoint character, and on the receiving end of harsh treatment by the guards. He missed a battle drill because he was sleeping off a wild night and realizes what this is about. There had been a rush through the gates that showed a coordination that was only possible if someone on Medina had helped them. Someone in communications. Vanderkost realizes Salas, Jakulski, and Roberts all had either a means or a motive to be involved, although none of them are picked up. Roberts is the one, noting the beating Vanderkost has taken, that voices the question, why fight if it's just to replace an earther boot with a belter one stomping on them? The five other members of the Rosinante crew all get at least one chapter. First is Clarissa, during the fight with the Azure Dragon when she was nearly killed. It allows us to sense how much she relishes the opportunity for rebirth that joining the crew has offered. She also sees Holden as he really is, as a mortal instead of a larger-than-life figure. Alex, we see, is very interested in Sandra Ip, but takes time out to try to help Holden out of his funk once they've retaken series, helping to inspire Holden to try his video project. But Alex and Ip do wind up in bed together, and not a one-night stand either, and it's an ongoing thing. But when it's time to ship out, he resists the urge to promise her things about the future, and Ip can sense that, but appreciates he's not ruining this with empty gestures. Amos also is getting some action, although in the brothel, the story reflects on how more intellectual it all is for him, the realization that he had a growing urge and it would need to be tended to. It was nothing more than that. It was a form of maintenance in a way, but on himself. 
Bobby had earlier had one of her two chapters of the book occur during the fight with the Free Navy, when she scored what should have been the winning hit, and showed her moving a step towards resolving her longtime survivor's guilt. When Amos overhears her arguing with Holden about her leading the attack on the railguns in the slow zone, Amos takes her side. You use a hammer to deal with a nail. You use a Bobby Draper to deal with a railgun. But this is when Amos, who has been unable to sleep because of the aforementioned winning hit that didn't destroy Marco once and for all, tells Holden he's figured out why the missile didn't explode. Holden is straight with him, and Amos isn't upset about it. As he puts it, it was the righteous thing, but he makes the point that Holden is now Fred Johnson, and he probably doesn't have the luxury of making that choice. He even offers to lock Holden out so that he can't do it again, as a help to Holden, not a lack of trust in him. As with all of these, it's a reflection back to Nemesis games. Amos sees Holden as the righteous man, and if he makes a call, it's the right one, morally speaking. It's only that when they choose to fight, they can't then choose to lose the fight. Alex has learned his experience last time not to promise what he knows is beyond his ability to keep. And even Clarissa has to contend with the difference between the public image of Holden and the man himself. Two other previous viewpoint characters, both from Caliban's War, Prax and Avasarla, are here. She is obviously dealing with the catastrophe of Earth while needing to bring justice for the criminals that are responsible for it. This takes on a special ring when you are aware of her own loss. Her husband is one of the missing on Earth, and realistically should be presumed dead. When she told Naomi at the end of Nemesis Games that there would be no amnesty for dropping the rocks, no matter what, we see that wasn't just for the sake of Earth. She is handling this situation with as much political detachment as anyone could possibly expect, doing what seems like the best thing every step of the way, but allowing whoever murdered, her word for the casualties of the asteroids, remember, Whoever murdered her husband to avoid punishment, that is a bridge too far. That's also part of what makes this a crime. The Free Navy announced themselves after the rocks fell. There was no declaration of war. This was no act of war. Arjun was no casualty of war. He was the victim of an act of depraved indifference of human life, tossing a rock down a gravity well for no reason other than to kill. Avasarla is dividing her attention in three directions, then. The Earth Crisis, the Free Navy Threat, and the Missing Ships. It might seem that last one should be a low priority, but recall that she knew the alien threat was the priority back in Caliban's War. If the alien technology is consuming ships, then even in unprecedented times, it still needed to be a priority. She persuades Prime Minister Smith of Mars, who is losing his position thanks to all of this, to give her the data that Mars has been holding back in order to help with this investigation. Prax, however, was completely oblivious to all of that. With his daughter back and in a healthy relationship with a woman with her own daughter, Prax was completely focused upon work and family. But when they have a breakthrough on a new form of nutritional yeast that grows thanks to radiation and thus can quickly replicate like the protomolecule without the threat that it poses, Carvanites wants to skip the animal trials to use it to feed the starving on Earth. The other scientist doesn't agree, and Prax feels trapped in the middle. There are a number of legitimate reasons not to, legally, ethically, and of course, politically. Ganymede was neutral but within the sphere of free Navy control, which meant you can be neutral so long as when Marco Anaro says jump, you say how high. As proof, Carvanites is found dead that night, and Prax forced to pretend to the security forces that he had no idea who would want to kill someone who wanted to help starving Earthers. But later on, while thinking about Carvanites and seeing Holden's video series and similar videos that are being made by people on Earth about their own culture, Prax arranges for the data to be sent to Earth, where Avasarla okays its use to try to resolve the problem of starvation. Remember that it was people watching his video providing the funds needed to get May back when it seemed certain that she was gone forever. So it's no wonder that the common humanity of others would move him to take the risk. 
Indeed, when the Free Navy and Pinkwater Security pick him up to question him about it, Prax confesses everything in a moment of profound bravery. He is saved only by the fact that he is such a scientist down to his core. I mean, he actually mistook a question about political resistance to be a query about how electricity works, that his confession sounded like a scientific description of how the yeast works, and he's let off with a, just be more careful next time. But Prax's situation reminds us of Vanderkoss, an actual member of the Free Navy, having their lives in jeopardy because of the Free Navy that's supposed to be for the belt. As so often happens when the revolution comes to a poor and impoverished nation, all that happens is it's someone else who's now wearing the boot.